This place is a treasure house of arts and crafts furnishings. Let's take a look in this dining room. Look at these chairs. They still have their original leather coverings. And look at this, a Morris chair, named after William Morris, the founder of the arts and crafts movement in England. But over here is what I wanted you to see. This sofa, or as Sickley would have called it, a settle. Now back then it would have cost you about $80 to get one of these. Don't even ask me what it would cost today. You know, I like the proportions. It's comfortable. And the size seems just about right. But what I like most of all is the look. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely will considerably lessen the possibility of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built this sofa. Now this sofa that I made is about six feet long and made to comfortably seat two people. What you have to do is imagine that here we're going to place a cushion about eight or nine inches thick along the bottom. That'll bring it up above the floor the correct height. And then along the back, we'll place a couple cushions and maybe some pillows on the ends. Now, even though the cushions will hide all this nice oak, you'll still be able to see it from the back and the ends. Now, when I went to buy the material for this, I ran into a problem. I wanted 4 by 4s for the corner post, solid oak. And I couldn't find any unless I was willing to wait a long time to get them or pay a premium price. But I was able to find some 8 quarter by 4 oak. It's 3 and a half inches wide an inch and three quarters thick. So what happens is if I glue two of them together, I end up with a piece of four by four. Now, even though this material that I bought was a real good quality, when I glued it together, I still ended up with a slight variation between the two pieces. So what I have to do is even it up, and I'm using my thickness planer. The idea is to take about a 32nd of an inch off one of the face sides and one of the edges on all four blanks before I make any adjustments to the machine. Now just make a slight adjustment to my machine, take another 32nd of an inch off, this time on the opposing face and the opposing edge. Doing the process in this sequence assures me of four identical posts. Well, I've just finished laying out my post for several mortises that are necessary to join all the rails together. Now the first one that I want to work on is a through mortise for the side rails. What that allows me to do is expose the ends of my tenons, both at the top and bottom of the back post and at the top and bottom of the front post. Now, to make that mortise, I'm going to use my drill press, which I've set up with a mortising attachment. And it has several parts. One is this fence against which I hold the stock. And there's a hold-down piece right here, which allows me to pull the chisel out of the work and not lift the piece of wood off the table. Then there's the chisel itself, which is a hollow square chisel that slips into a chisel holder, which is attached to the spindle of the drill press. Now, inside the chuck of the drill press is a bit, a special bit for this attachment, which passes through the chisel, and it sticks below the chisel edge just slightly. And that's so that the drill will do most of the work, drilling out the wood first, and the chisel just squares it up. Now, because my mortise is 3 quarters of an inch wide, I'm going to be doing this in two steps, one from this side with my half-inch chisel, and I'll turn the work around finish up the width. Also, I don't want to go all the way through the piece in one step. I'll do half of it from this side, and then I'll flip it over to do the remaining. Well, let's get going. And now I just need to do that to the other three legs. Well, now I've just completed cutting one of several mortises that I need in the sides of the post. And these don't go all the way through. They're only about two and a half inches deep. And I'll show you over here on the prototype what they're for. The cross rails also have tenons, and they actually pass over the tenons from the side rails, but they don't go all the way through. I felt the post would be stronger that way. Now, on the front post, I need only one side mortise because there's only a lower rail. 
But on the back post, I'm going to need two. One for the top rail, one for the bottom rail. So I've been working on the final step of the mortising on the post. Let's look at the prototype, and I'll show you what I'm trying to do. Now, the mortises that I made for these through tenons are certainly large enough to hold the assembly together. But the problem is the rails are five and a half inches high. That means the bottom part of this top rail isn't really supported. It could twist out of shape. And I suppose I could have solved the problem by just simply making a larger mortise, which would have given me a larger tenon. That only works up here on the top front. Every place else where there are cross rails coming in, if I had made a large mortise, the side tenon could have only been an inch and a half long. And I don't think that's strong enough. So what I've done is taken the post and enlarged the mortise to give me the support I need to keep those rails from wanting to twist. Now the mortising attachment does a real nice job cutting these, but there's always a little bit of irregularity, which you can either clean up using a rasp or a nice sharp chisel. Well, that seems to fit pretty snugly. Now what I have here is a sample of the tenons that I'm going to be making. I need tenons at all the connections where the rails meet the post. And what I want to end up with to start is a four and a half inch high by three quarter inch thick tenon. Now the most critical cut are the shoulder cuts along the face and at the top and the bottom. And that's because when you slide the tenon into the mortise, you want it to fit perfectly tight against the face of the post. The best way to make those tenon cuts is on the table saw. Now, the idea is to set up a reference so that you can make all four cuts without having to change anything. The first thought would be to simply set the rip fence the right distance from the blade and use your bevel gauge to just pass it through, turning it around. But that's dangerous because whenever you have the miter gauge and the rip fence used in combination, you stand a chance of kickback. You could take a stop block and clamp it to your fence behind the saw blade, and that becomes a reference point to guide the pieces through. Now, for small pieces, that's OK. But the larger the piece gets, the more chance there is that as you go into the blade, you might slide a little bit or wander. And then that shoulder cut is not going to be very good. So what I've done is modified a miter gauge. I've taken another one that I have here in the shop and screwed a piece of wood to it, a long, straight piece. And we're not even going to use the rip fence with this system. Just slide it out of the way. And after I put the piece of wood on the miter gauge, I made one pass through the saw. That gives me a precise location of where it's going to cut. From that mark, I can measure over whatever length tenon I want. In this case, I've fastened a stop block here for my longer tenons. And later, I'll move it to this other line for some short tenons. All I have to do is hold my stock against the stop block and just keep passing it through. The first cut is along the face, 3 eighths of an inch deep. I'll do both sides of both ends of all the pieces. Okay, now that's a half inch. I've raised the blade to a half inch above the table, and now I'm ready to make the shoulder cuts along the edges. Well, now I'm going to turn to my band saw to make the cheek cuts. And those are the cuts that remove the material around the sides of the tenon. Now on the band saw, if you try to hold a board that's only an inch and a half wide, perfectly perpendicular to the table surface, it's not easy. It wants to rock. And even if I was to use the standard rip fence that comes with the saw, that's only two inches high. So I've made a device, a jig, to fit on it. Two pieces of plywood screwed together at a perfect 90 degree angle, and that'll hold my piece directly in line with the blade. Now I've set the fence the right distance away to take the material off the side of the tenon so that it falls away rather than on the other side where it might get jammed up in the blade. It's a one inch bandsaw blade because we're making such a big cut and I've installed a stop block over here which will stop me from going too far and ruining those nice shoulder cuts. It works great, watch. Now, 
Now I removed my jig because for this cut I can use the standard rib fence because the material is on the flat. And I've set up to cut the top and bottom edges of the tenon. Now I've set the band saw up to make a cut so that I end up with a tenon that's exactly two and a half inches wide. That's the piece that's going to go all the way through the post. The next cut will be right here, removing this waste material. And this is the part of the tenon that's going to stop it from twisting. Well, I've just laid out for some mortises that I'm going to cut to hold the slats in place. Now the slats are set up in such a way that the space between is equal to the width of the slat itself, or approximately equal. And that's purely for aesthetic reasons. The whole series of slats on the side and down the back. Now the first thing I'm going to do is cut the mortises for all those slats. I'm going to use the drill press again, which is still set up with the mortising attachment. And I've set it up to cut a mortise about an inch deep, centered on the piece, a half inch wide, and about two inches long. And there's quite a few, so it's going to take a while. I finally finished making all the mortises for the slats. And this morning I started dry fitting the piece together. Now, you might wonder why I go through all this trouble. Well, really what I want to do is make sure that all the mortises and tenons for the rails and the posts are correctly made and, you know, fine-tune them. But more importantly, I want to check the distance between the top and bottom rail. And I've made a little stick which fits in this side, and I just measured it roughly. This is the side that has the greatest distance between the top and bottom rail. And I'm going to use this gauge stick to check the other areas. Now, on this end, it seems okay. But over here, it's not going to fit. And what I want to do here is make all the slats uniform, the same size. I want to mass produce them. So I'm going to trim a little bit off of these top rails to make them consistent. And to do that, I think I'll just use my joiner. Now the joiner is the perfect tool for taking off small amounts of material like I have here. The overall amount that I have to remove is about a sixteenth strong, or a little more than a sixteenth of an inch. I don't want to take it off all at once. I've set the joiner up to remove about a thirty-second of an inch at a pass, and I'll keep going until I get to my line. Well, now what I'm doing is making the shoulder cuts on the slats. There's actually 20 of them in all. And to do that, I've turned back to my jig, which is set up on my miter gauge. And all I've really done is moved my stop block over so that I get this shorter tenon. And to check the whole layout, I just use my gauge stick. And as you can see, when I place it in line with the shoulder cuts, they're even on both ends. So I'm all set. Well, as before, I'm turning to my bandsaw, equipped with the factory rip fence, to remove the rest of the material to complete the tenon. What I've done now is tilted the fence on my joiner to 45 degrees. And what that does is it allows me to knock off the corners of the slats. You know, you can't go buy one of these pieces without wanting to touch it. I mean, that's part of the craftsman style. So it's important that all the edges are eased. You don't have any sharp places to injure yourself, I suppose. And I'm going to start by easing the edges on the post. And to do that, I'm going to use a 3 8 inch radius rounding over bit. And I'm going to hit all the sharp corners. Well, now I'm ready to ease the edges on the 2 by 6s and these clamps come in real handy. They not only secure to the workbench, but they also hold the piece securely in place while I route it. 
I've also switched to a quarter inch round over bit. And it's not set to full depth. I'm just taking a little bit of these corners off. Now there's one more thing. I mustn't forget to round over the ends of the tenons where they stick through these posts. Because if I don't do it now, I'll never be able to do it later. And I'll just use my router. Well now I can't forget the sanding. Okay, now I'm ready for some assembly. And the first thing is to install the slats in the rails. And they're just dry, no glue on those tenons. But where the rails fit into the post, I have used glue. And also, I numbered all the joints so that when I put it together, it's exactly as it was when it was dry fit. Boy, I almost don't need any glue on those joints. I have let all the slats float, except for a couple, the middle two along this back. And that's because as you sit on the couch, weight will be transferred to the bottom rail, and I don't want it to separate. So I'll just pin it with a couple dollars. Now, moving quickly, before the glue dries on all these tenons, I gotta put this whole assembly together, clamp it, and pin it with some more dowels. Now for the tricky part, getting the other side on. Oh well, I did it before. Now a clamp to hold it all together. Now for some dowels. Now with the last dowel in, I can remove the clamps, sand the dowels flush to the post. Now I can put the frame and the plywood that's going to support the cushions. Now I've just made a frame out of some one by threes to support the plywood. And I've got a couple additional cross members here, which is simply half lap together. I use this little guide stick to accurately position the frame while I nail it. And finally, a piece of plywood glued and nailed to the frame. Well, a little more fine sanding, and this piece will be ready for some finish. I suspect that Stickley probably would have finished it kind of dark. But you know, this oak is so handsome, I might think about using a clear finish. When it came time to apply the finish to my sofa, I could have used a brush, but it would have taken me a long time to go around all the slats. So I chose to use my home sprayer. The product is a water-soluble polyurethane. It's very hard, and because it dries quickly, I can put on four or five coats in about an hour and a half. It's non-toxic, but I do wear a mask to protect me from the mist that might be in the air. And best of all, I can clean the whole sprayer up in just a few minutes with soap and water. Well, that wasn't too bad. Now all I need to complete this project are the cushions, and they're on the way.